Bonnie Hawkins, and welcome to, come on, and you're welcome to another Emanuel Online service. Okay, and we're going to get started right now. Come on. Come on. God wants to forgive me. Now, so, wait a minute. What if I really mess up? What if I'm... You are merciful and you are to church? forgive. Don't about that. Man, you guys sound really, really good this morning. You know, we were we were singing uh, Reckless Love, and Pastor Stan leaned over to me and said, he said, I'm going to preach a message. I'm going to preach a reckless message. Brother, you've preached reckless messages before. <laughs> Man, what an awesome, awesome day to be at Emmanuel. Isn't it fun to come to church with the sun out for a change? Yay! Hasn't Amen. done that since 1986. And so, <laughs> man, it is uh, awesome. Somebody, 1980 what? Never mind. Don't worry about it. Hey, how many of you know that God is a merciful God this morning? Yes, he is. He is. He? The Bible yes, says that he, he is. is compassionate, he is loving, and he is kind. His mercy is infinite. It is unlimited, and it is eternal. Amen. You know, a lot of times we believe, or we say that we believe, that God is a merciful God, but, but sometimes we don't feel like God is merciful. Sometimes what we feel like he's kind of out to get us. Well, listen to what Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 31 says. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you or destroy you. That's good news, isn't it? Amen. He will not abandon you. He will not destroy you or forget the solemn covenant he made with your ancestors. You know, sometimes we're afraid in church to wonder what's in it for me. Well, this morning, I want us to talk about that. I want us to talk about the, the, the benefit of, of, of mercy. What good is it in my life? Well, I'm going to share some things with you, really two main points. Number one, mercy means God forgives me. Mercy means that God forgives me. And I want to share three truths about God's forgiveness that will help you this morning. Number one, this is awesome. You'll love this. God wants to forgive me. God wants to forgive me. Now, I said, well, wait a minute. Well, what if I really mess up? What if I really fall short? What if I do something really dark and evil? Does God still want to forgive me? And the answer is yes. Listen to Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 17. But our God, you are merciful and quick to forgive. Go ahead and circle those words, quick to forgive. Some of you need to hear that this morning. But, but our God, you are merciful and quick to forgive. You are loving kind and very patient there's our definition of mercy right there so you never turned away from them never there's never been a time where god has turned his back on you there's never been a time where you you messed up or you fell short or you sinned or you didn't do what god wanted you to do and god just kind of threw his hands out and said you know what i'm done with you i'm going to turn my back i'm going to walk away god has never ever ever done that but you know, in life, sometimes we experience that, don't we? I mean, we, we may have had a, a failed relationship and, and the other person just looks at us and just kind of throws their hands out and says, you know what, I'm, I'm done with you. I'm finished with this relationship. And they walk out because we've fallen short. Or, or maybe we didn't do a good enough job at work and our boss warned us over and over again. And finally, they just say, you know what, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. I'm, I'm walking out on you. But the truth with God is this. He has never abandoned us. He'll never turn away. The Bible says that he is quick to forgive. God is a merciful God. Micah chapter 7 verse 18 is a verse you'll want to remember this morning. Micah chapter 7 verse 18 says this. Where is another God like you? I mean, is, is there another God like, like our God is, is the question. Where is another God like you who pardons the guilt of the remnant, who forgives the guilt of the remnant, overlooking the sins of his special people? Now, now please understand, uh, overlooking the sins of his people here does not mean that, that, that God just kind of dismisses it, doesn't pay attention to it. But what he's simply saying is that, that, that God chooses not to hold on to it. He chooses not to be negative about this. He overlooks the sins of his people. And then he says this. You will not stay angry with your people forever. Don't miss this. Because you delight in showing your unfailing love. Isn't that awesome? That, that God delights in you. God delights in showing his, his unfailing love. It's not something that he does reluctantly or begrudgingly. It's not something that he holds back. But, but the Bible says that, that he delights in showing you his unfailing love. Isn't that awesome? He longs to show his unfailing love. He pardons our guilt, the Bible says. He doesn't hold a grudge. 
you don't have to raise your hand this morning. Please don't raise your hand. I don't want you to be embarrassed. But, but have you ever held a grudge against anybody for something they did against you? I mean, they, they said something, did something to hurt you in some way. And, and for whatever reason, you just held a grudge. Well, that's not the way God operates. That's not the way God functions in our life. The Bible teaches us that, that he delights in showing his unfailing love. Paul, writing to the believers in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, says that love keeps no record of wrongs. He wants to forgive you of every sin that you've ever committed. I mean, from the darkest, most vile thing that you've ever done in your life to what we like to call those little white lies. <laughs> and there's no such thing as that, right, church? But, but whatever we might call dark and dirty and nasty and, and sinful and sinister, God is willing to forgive those things. He, he delights to show his love and his mercy. And even when we mess up just a quote-unquote little bit, God is willing and longs to show his unfailing love. He doesn't forgive begrudgingly. He's not reluctant in his love, but he freely and willfully delights in showing his love and his mercy toward us, wanting to forgive us. He does not want us to walk around with the weight and the burden and the shame of sin. God wants you to be free for, and forgiven forever. The Bible says that he delights in showing his unfailing love. Let me share a second truth about forgiveness. God's forgiveness. Number two, God freely forgives me. God freely forgives me. Listen to what Romans 3, 23 and 24 say. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us have messed up, fallen short, sinned. I mean, if we had a giant dartboard back there and, and we had the darts and we were throwing, we may get close to the board. We might get on the board, but we're not going to hit the bullseye every single time. That's what it means to fall short of the glory of God. And then listen to what he writes in verse 24. They are justified freely. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. They are justified freely by his grace. That is unearned favor through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The word justified or justification is an interesting word. We use it, Pete, around church all the time, but most of us don't even know what it means. It's really one coin with two sides. When we are justified, there are two things that take place. Number one, God declares you not guilty. The, the things that you've done wrong, the sins that you've uh, you committed, the, the, the shortcomings, everything that we've done falling short of the glory of God. He looks at all of these things and he says to us, you are not guilty. I say, well, wait a minute, God, I am guilty. I, I have committed these things. I, I have done these sins. And God says, yes, you have. But your punishment and your shame and your guilt is not something that you have to take care of. It's something my, my son Jesus has taken care of 2,000 years ago on the cross. And so on one side of the coin, he declares us not guilty. But then I love the second side of the coin. He declares us righteous. In other words, he says, you are right with me. You are in right relationship with me. Not only are you not guilty, but better than that, we're okay. And I've taken care of that 2,000 years ago. God freely forgives us. Forgiveness is free to us, but it costs Jesus everything. It cost him his life. I, I've been reading through the book of Mark for the past several months in my quiet time. And, and, and three times, three times Jesus told his disciples, he said, guys, um, I, I'm going to be arrested and I'm going to be unjustly tried and I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried in a tomb on the third day I will rise again and I'll meet you in Galilee three times Jesus predicted his own death burial and resurrection it cost Jesus everything the very thing that cost Jesus his life is freely given to you and to me for some of us we have been saved from sin now listen carefully some of us have been saved from sin some of us gave our lives to Christ early on in our lives and we were spared a life of brokenness and addiction and pain and suffering and loss. But listen, if that's your case, like it is my case, we so desperately needed to be freely forgiven by Jesus Christ. We didn't need any less grace than anybody else that has ever walked on this face, on the face of the earth. But secondly, some of you have been saved out of sin. I mean, you were, in, you were in it deep. I mean, you were in the midst of addiction and brokenness and suffering and pain and failed relationships. And you were at your wit's end. Just like us, those of us who have been saved from sin, he saved you out of sin. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalm 40, verse 2. 
He lifted me out of the slimy pit. Out of the mud and the mire, he set my feet, the Bible says, on a rock. Isn't that powerful? I mean, it, it doesn't matter if you gave your life to Christ when you were six years old and the worst thing you ever did was break the crayons in the box. <laughs> or if you committed murder or something worse. We so desperately needed a Savior. And He is willing to forgive us freely. A third truth about God's forgiveness I want to share with you this morning is this. That God completely forgives me. He never holds back one ounce of mercy. He completely forgives us. Listen to Micah chapter 7 verse 19 once again. Once again you will have compassion on us. Once again Micah writes you will have compassion on us. You will show your love to us. You will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. Isn't that powerful? Y'all didn't hear that verse did you? P P Peter heard it didn't you? Pete you heard because you said uh-huh. I heard you say uh-huh. I heard you Pete. Listen, listen to it one more time. Micah says once again once again, God, you, you showed your compassion, your, your unfailing, your reckless love on us. And then Micah says with confidence, listen, you, you'll take our sins and you'll, you'll trample our sins under your feet, God. And, and then you throw them into the depths of the ocean. God is willing to forgive us completely for every sin that we've ever committed. One of my favorite offerings in the Old Testament was the drink offering. No, I'm not a drinker, but the drink offering is pretty cool because it was so small. See, the priest would, would, would take the sacrificial animal and, and burn it on the altar. But then he would take a quart of wine, the drink offering, and he would walk around the entire altar. And he would pour the water around the altar, not saving a single drop of wine. Because it pictures God's mercy being poured out his forgiveness not holding a single drop back the bible says that he wants to forgive us completely there's no such thing as being forgiven a little amen <laughs> there's no such thing i, I mean can you imagine go to, going to your wife guys and say uh, baby i blew it will you forgive me and she says yeah i'll forgive you a little Whew, i'm glad we're back where we should be <laughs> that feels good can you imagine going to God and say, God, would you forgive me for my sins? And God says, absolutely, I'll forgive you a little bit. No. God takes that, that cord of wine of his forgiveness and mercy. And, and he walks around and he takes every drop out and taps it just to make sure there's nothing left inside. He does that for you and for me. Amen. Listen to the poetic words of Micah again. He says, you will trample our sins under your feet and throw them into the depths of the ocean. Amen. He tramples our sin and casts it into the sea of forgetfulness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can, can you imagine with me for just a moment? Use your, use your faith. Use your mind's eye of faith for a moment. We're, we're out in the ocean together, as far out as we can go, as, as deep as the ocean gets. And we take the, the anchor of our sin, the weight of our sin, and we, and we drop it in the water. And, and there that object begins to sink down to the bottom, hundreds and thousands of feet, to the deepest part of the ocean floor. Lost. Gone. Forever. That's what God wants to do with your sin and my sin. And if God is willing to do that with our sin, why do we hold on to it when he wants to forgive us completely? Listen to this incredible paraphrase of Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. Incredible words. With the arrival of Jesus, Paul writes, the Messiah, that the fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter Christ being here for us no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. We don't have to live under the, the shame and the guilt, the darkness of our sin, the Bible says. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. Isn't that powerful? God is willing to forgive you 
completely. Is there anything more powerful than forgiveness? I mean, every sin, every lie, every missed opportunity to do good, every evil thought, every evil deed, every broken promise, every sin that we've ever committed or will ever forget, God says, I am willing to forgive you completely. I will trample your sins under my feet. I will cast them into the, into the sea of forgetfulness to remember them no more. God is willing to do that Amen. for you and Amen. for me. God is is a merciful God. Mercy means that God is willing to forgive you and me. But secondly, this morning, mercy means I forgive others. Amen. Not only do I enjoy the, the forgiveness of God, but I enjoy the opportunity to be like God in the fact that I have the opportunity to forgive. I want to share four truths with you today that will help you to forgive others. Number one, forgiveness is not conditional. Forgiveness is not conditional. This is not an option for every follower of Jesus Christ. If, if you think I have the right to forgive or the opportunity to forgive or the possibility of forgiving, you are dead wrong. Listen to what the Bible says in Ephesians 4.32. Paul writes, and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another. And then he adds these words, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Amen. How many of us enjoy the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? Amen. How many of us extend the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? Mm, <laughs> sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Forgiveness is not optional. Amen. It's not conditional. Who of us here this morning do not enjoy the kindness and the forgiveness and the compassion of God? We all do. But we must forgive others in the same manner. We must forgive others unconditionally and completely. But you might say, well, but Brother Rick, you, you don't know what he did to me. Or you don't know what she did to me. I, 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 can't, I can't forgive them. Or stronger yet, I'll never forgive them. Oh, they have hurt me so deeply. They have caused so much despair and anguish in my life. There is no way I can forgive them. As followers of Jesus Christ, forgiveness is not conditional. It is not an option. If we enjoy the forgiveness from God, we need to extend the forgiveness of God to others. And I'm going to help you with this. Don't get mad and leave yet. We have donuts later, but not now. Let me share a second truth about forgiving others that will help you. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not forgetting. We've heard wrongfully, perhaps, that we need to forgive and forget. Listen, you and I do not have the capacity or the capability of, of trampling on sins with our feet and casting them into the depths of the ocean. God has given us the ability to remember things. It's interesting, the older we get, we can't remember what we had for breakfast, but we can remember something 20, 30, 40 years ago, right? <laughs> and we can remember sin <laughs> and heartbreak. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness isn't forgetting, but willfully choosing to extend the mercy of God. Let me share that again. Forgiveness is, is not forgetting, but it's an act of the will. It's choosing to extend the same mercy, the same unfailing, reckless love, to extend forgiveness like God has extended it to us. It is an act of the will. It is a choice that we make to love and to forgive like Jesus. Mercy is not about forgetfulness, but it's about an act of the will. I want to share with you an amazing passage as we close the message with the last couple points this morning. Paul was writing to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. And he's coming to the end of 2 Timothy, a letter that he wrote to this young preacher boy. And usually at the end of the letters, our letters, we, we write nice stuff, right? Hey, hope you have a great week or look forward to seeing you soon. Well, well, Paul did that, but before he got to, to that point, he addressed some serious issues that he wanted to warn Timothy about. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, we read these words. Alexander, the craftsman who, who works with metal, he's an iron guy, he's a steel guy. Alexander, the craftsman who works with metal, Paul writes, he has really hurt me. The Lord will repay him back for what he's done. But watch out for him because he opposes 
our teaching. Interesting. Did, did Paul forget that Alexander hurt him? No. Did, did, he, did he forget that, that everything they tried to do, this guy Alexander, this, this metal worker, everything they tried to do, he stood in opposition to, to what God was doing through this ministry team. He didn't forget. Matter of fact, it was so painful, whatever Alexander did to him, it was so painful that him, to him that Paul identified him by name. <laughs> he said, I remember Alexander. I remember him by name. And we have people in our lives that, that have hurt us. And, and if I give you 13 seconds, you, you could probably begin to list all their names in your head, couldn't you? Forgiveness is not about forgetting, but choosing to extend mercy. Let me share this with you. Every time you think of that person by name, Every time their, their face comes to you or, or you're on Facebook and you, and you see a post and, and all of a sudden you, you just start to cringe inside and you get worked up inside and, and the anger begins to, to be rekindled. Rather than thinking about the hurt, we should think about the mercy that they so desperately need. Forgiveness is not about forgetting. Number three, forgiveness is not trusting that person again, at least not right away. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 15. Again, Paul's writing to Timothy. And he says, he says this. He says, but watch out for Alexander. Watch out for him. Because he opposes our teaching. Listen to what Paul is saying. Watch out for him. He's not to be trusted right now. They say, well, that's harsh and mean. No, that's reality, isn't it? We, we all have people in our lives that, that, that we can forgive, but... But it doesn't mean we automatically trust right away. Has there been anybody in your life that has hurt you? Sure. You, you know them by name. You, you know what took place. The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to forgive them just as Christ Jesus forgave us. But it doesn't mean we have to trust them back into our lives. Let me give you... Two examples of this really quickly. We have four children, and, and when they were smaller, we used to enjoy going out on dates. And our daughter asked us one time, she said, Mama, are you going on a hot date or a cold date? <laughs> that was a great question. Then I think it was a cold date. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> we used to use babysitters. And we had people that we trusted in our lives. What would have happened? What would have happened if, if one time our children were hurt or violated or they were in danger because of neglect or some other dark and desperate thing that they did to our children? Are, are we expected to forgive them? The answer is yes. Are we expected to trust them again with our children? The answer is you know, watch out for Alexander. Watch out. We'll say, well, wait a minute. I mean, I, I thought we were supposed to forgive and forget. Where is that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. Isn't it interesting that it takes a lifetime to build trust. And if there's ever a mistake, if there's ever a sin, if there's ever a misstep, that trust could be broken immediately. And then it'll take another lifetime to rebuild that trust. It's true in marriage. It's true in families. It's true in life. It's true in the circles of Christianity. Let me share a second illustration with you let's say tragically and i hate to even even suggest this but 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 what if somebody physically assaulted my wife she's sitting down here what if the love of my life what if she was assaulted by somebody and and viciously hurt and, and am i supposed to carry that grudge around and and that hate around the rest of my life or am i supposed to forgive the one who attacked my wife the Bible says we're supposed to forgive. But do I ever trust that man again? Absolutely not. See, there's a difference. Forgiveness is not trusting that person, at least not right away. It doesn't mean we never trust them again. But the reality is that rebuilding trust takes time. It just takes time. Let me share a fourth truth with you. And then we're done this morning. Forgiveness is releasing it to God. 
I love what Paul did. I love the example that he set for us. In verse 14, he writes, Alexander the craftsman who works with metal has really hurt me, but he doesn't stop there. He says the Lord will pay him back for what he's done. Do you see it? It's right there, isn't it? See, forgiveness and, and mercy and grace releases that person to, to the Lord. Can, can you imagine how spiteful and angry and, and hateful Paul would have become if he would have said, vengeance is mine, saith Paul. <laughs> like some of us do. Actually, if you think about it, it's kind of funny. He, he sent... He said the biggest one after him. He said, oh, God's going to take care of you, man. <laughs> I, I can't do anything to you that, that God can't do. Forgiveness means to offer the gift of grace, unearned, undeserved. That's the definition of mercy. Paul didn't have to repay evil for evil. He, he didn't have to be vengeful or, or spiteful. He, he didn't have to be mean-spirited. He, he didn't have to walk around to figure out how to hurt Alexander as much as Alexander hurt him. He said, listen, he said, mercy and forgiveness demands that I turn you over to God. God will take care of this. Can you imagine how distracted Paul would have been in his ministry if he would have sought vengeance to everyone who sought to do him harm? But Paul kept focused. Forgiveness means to release and to set them free. Don't hold people captive hoping to inflict the same amount of pain on them as they inflict it on you. When you hold on to a hurt, it can become a hate. Some of you need to hear that. When we hold on to a hurt, it can become a hate. And God is too good. Life is too short and eternity is too long to hold on to a hurt and fan the flam, flames of hate. To fan the flames of hate. Listen, why do we do that? Perhaps we need to follow the example of Paul. Amen. Say, you know what? So and so hurt me. I mean, they stood in opposition. They did this. They did that. God will take care of that. That's not my business. See, mercy means that God has forgiven me. Mercy means that, that God has forgiven you. Every sin of your life, every mistake, every act of rebellion, any, every sign of disobedience, everything that you've ever done wrong, God is willing to forgive you. That's mercy. And secondly, mercy means that I forgive others. Is it easy? No. Do we forget? No. No. But it's an act of the will, and we choose to forgive others. Listen, maybe you're here this morning, and you've heard me talk about mercy, and maybe you've been here for the entire series, and, and you say, you know what, I, I, I've, never, I've never been forgiven by God. I, I've, I've never reached out to Him and, and sought His forgiveness. I, I've, I've never come to God and said, Look, God, here I am, I'm a mess, I'm, I'm broken, I'm... I'm lost. Maybe you've never received mercy from God because you've never asked for it. But you can today. In just a moment, I'm going to lead you in a prayer that will help you do it. But maybe today's the day. Maybe today is the day that, that you say yes to Jesus Christ. And, and for the rest of us, maybe there's some people in our lives that we need to forgive. We all have Alexanders, don't we? That's not her name. That's not his name. But we got them. And you're probably thinking about them right now. And you've held them in the cell of shame and frustration and anger and hate for a long time. Let him go. Do you forget? No. Give them over to God. Amen. Let, let God do his thing. He's pretty good at it. Forgive those who have hurt you deep. That's the power of mercy. 
Let's pray. Father God, th there are some here today that have never received mercy. Unearned forgiveness, undeserved kindness. They've never asked God for you to forgive them. But, but today, right now, Lord, they want to. They know they need to. And my friend, if that's you today. I'm going to ask you to make a first time commitment to Jesus Christ. And, and I want you to talk to God. I, I want you to use your own words. You don't have to say it audibly. Just your heart to God's heart. He hears that best anyway. Say something like this. To the Father. God, here I am. Brokenness and all. I so desperately need your forgiveness. For everything that I've done wrong. All of my mistakes. I believe you call it sin. I want a new chance. I want a new life. I want a do-over. So God, the best way I know how. I'm saying yes to you. I'm giving my life completely to you. And I'm asking you to be my God. And I'll be your follower. God, I want to do this for my entire life. I'm all yours. And I'm all in. I'm going to ask you to continue praying. Just you and the Lord. Use your own words now. See, the rest of us here, we, we need to wrestle with some things. Because there's probably some sin in your life that you have not confessed. Areas where mercy is much needed. But you haven't confessed those sins yet to the Lord. You're holding on to them. Or maybe others have hurt you. And you're holding on to that anger and that hate. And it's not doing them harm, but it's eating you alive. Give them to God. You can trust him here. You spend some time praying. We'll pray together. Father God, thank you so much that you delight in us and you enjoy demonstrating your unfailing love to us. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been, hi, this has been another audio broadcast with me, video the uh, program today um i want to thank you guys for tuning in this is bonnie hawkins i want to thank you for tuning in to an audio broadcast of the emmanuel church of huntingtown maryland where the pastor is pastor rick hancock and uh, the service today was called mercy forgives and isn't that true mercy is forgiving because what jesus did it's nothing i did it's what jesus did so I'm thanking the Lord. Lord, I thank you. I thank you. Can you thank the Lord while I'm thanking the Lord for anything that he, for what he has done in your life and with you and with your family? Father God, we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we thank you, Father God. And yes, I hope you guys tune into our very next episode right here on the Bonnie Hawkins channel for another episode of Emmanuel Church Online. Okay. And this is the video, me video taping the audio and video of my church, Emmanuel Church, Huntingtown, Maryland. God bless you all. Okay, so we're going to see you on the next time, on the next go round. Let me back up a little bit here. <laughs> Okay, so we'll see you again on the next broadcast.
God bless you all from Bonnie Hawkins. God bless you all.